Well, good morning, Pastor Karen here. It's so great that you could join us this morning. Well, I'm really excited about today's message because we're going to be doing part two of our Garden Talk series. You'll remember uh, several weeks ago by now, Margaret Clausen shared part one. She shared the life lessons that she has learned while gardening. She talked about the different aspects of gardening, right? Like planting and seeding and fertilizing and that kind of thing. And if you saw that video online, you remember that we also showed you some of her vegetable plants from her garden and beautiful flowers that she harvested. Well, you'll know by now that you don't get that kind of harvest, you know, without having a basic understanding of gardening and diligent application. You know, my husband and I have done a little bit of gardening, but we've also done quite a bit of landscaping over the years as we have built most of the houses that we have lived in. And one thing that we have discovered about landscaping and planting trees or plants, bushes, that kind of thing, is it really depends on the type of soil you have with the the types of uh, plants that that you want to plant. For instance, you know, the first place that we lived um, with, the first house that we built in, the soil was actually quite sandy. And compared to the soil where we live right now, it's actually quite clay-like. So no two plantings are equal. As well as we also learned that the condition of the soil is really important as it'll determine whether something, you know, survives or dies, right? In fact, according to the Manitoba Government of Agriculture, they said that care for soil is key, you know, to determine whether something will succeed or not. In fact, they go on to say that the first step in sustainable soil management is ensuring that the soil will, in fact, support the land use activity. You know, several weeks ago, my husband and I were um, heading out of town. We were driving on Lash, heading towards Highway Number 6 as we were going to a family get-together. And we were passing this one um, new development. At least that's what my husband said it was. And I said, well, how can you tell that? He said, because look over there. And he pointed to this big, black, beautiful pile of topsoil. He said, you know, you don't need that kind of soil when you're building a house or any kind of construction. So they would have stripped the land of all that soil and probably sold it for a lot of money because topsoil is expensive nowadays, right? I know what they mean about uh, topsoil. We, In fact, we have a pile of that sitting right in front of our backyard right now. It's definitely not as beautiful as that pile was, as uh, it has grown all these weeds out of it, these, these bushes, these weeds. It's it's actually a bit of an eyesore. And so I've asked my husband a couple of times, can you please get rid of those weeds? And he says, no. And so I said, why are you getting rid of the weeds? He said, because the weeds are weighting down the soil. And if we were to pull the weeds, you know, to get rid of the weeds, um, we would lose the risk of losing some of our, 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 we would run the risk of losing some of our soil. And so it's literally keeping our soil from flying away. Well, so I don't want that. That doesn't make any sense, right? Considering how much we paid for that soil. The reason why I'm talking to you about soil is because in part two garden talk that I'm going to be sharing today, the title is your all heart and soil. And we're going to be looking at gardening, but specifically the soil of gardening. You know, uh, Eleanor was in the office a couple of weeks ago and, um, we were talking a little bit and, and she started laughing and she says, you're doing part two of garden talk, aren't you? And I said, yeah, why? And she goes, well, you don't strike me as the gardening type. And I laughed because I thought, Okay, well, what does that mean? What does a gardener look like? I don't know. But she's right. I'm no expert when it comes to gardening. But I'm not going to preach this message today as an expert. I'm going to let the Word of God do that. The Word of God is an expert. In fact, you know, Jesus used agriculture several times using these as parables or teachings when he was teaching the people. And and there's one parable that he uses, and it shows up in three of the four Gospels, where he compares the heart to the condition of soil and how we respond to the seed of the Word of God. And so we're going to look at that parable today, and we're going to be reading from Mark's Gospel, uh, begin in chapter 4, verse 3. And this is how Jesus explains this parable. He says, Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. And as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up and the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns which grew up and choked the plants, so they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on the good soil. It came up, it grew, and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some a 100 times. Then Jesus says, whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. So this parable has two titles. It's commonly known as the parable of the sower 
or the four soils. And now, you know, we don't relate as well to this parable as they would have, you know, the first century audience, as they would have understood the struggle to grow food. They would have understood, they would have related to the hard ground and how, you know, their primitive tools have little effect on. They would have understood when the grain grows up without taking root or, or the waste of the seed sometimes, or even those birds, those pesky birds, they were actually the farmer's biggest liability. Because when it came to seeding time, the birds considered this feeding time. And so the farmer had to ensure that he scattered his seed quite generously in order for some of the seed to take. And so the people back then, they would have understood this. This was just part of their everyday survival growing, growing their food. Unlike us, right? When we think of planting or, or farming, we think of farmers, you know, plowing up their fields and then using a special tool to plant the seed deep within the soil. You, you know what I'm saying? I mean, there would have been some type of plowing back in the first century, but it wasn't the standard. And so, um, although the disciples understood the agricultural part of the parable, they failed to get the application. And so when they were alone with Jesus, they asked him to explain this parable to them. And this is how Jesus explained it. He said, the farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seeds sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. And still others, like seeds sown among the thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seeds sown on good soil, they hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop, some thirty, some sixty, some a hundred times what was sown. So in this parable, we can see that Jesus uses three symbols. There's the sower, the seed, and the soil. So the sower is the farmer, and he represents anyone who shares the gospel, right? Whether you preach, teach, or just share on a one-to-one -one with another person. And the way that we share the gospel is considered to be the scattering of the seed. And that can look different from person to person. You know what I mean? I mean, for instance, you might be a biker and you might belong to CMA and the way that you scatter your seed might be on a one-to-one -one with another person at Tim Hortons. Or perhaps you scatter your seed uh, through pulpit preaching on a Sunday morning like I'm doing right now. Or maybe you scatter your seed and you share the gospel to an online audience. You know, you might share it through a YouTube video or through a podcast or that kind of thing. So we can see that, you know, the way that we communicate looks differently and it needs to look differently, you know, from generation to generation. The reason for this is no two generations, you know, have been reached the, exactly the same way. I mean, the boomers and, and Gen Xers did not come into the kingdom the same way. Uh, the boomers came into the kingdom either through the Jesus movement or through the charismatic movement, which swept across the nations in the 60s and the 70s. Unlike um, the millennials, the millennials are not attracted, you know, to the same church structure as the boomers are. The millennials are looking for authenticity. They want transparency. And they don't mind if church gets a little messy, you know, as long as there's um, relationship, as there's looking for family and community. And then there's the iGen or Gen Z, as we call them, you know, this new generation, this younger generation that has literally grown up on technology. I mean, it's no wonder that they have such an appetite for visual presentations, and we yet to see how this generation will be reached with the gospel. So we can see that the form of communicating, you know, the scattering, the sowing, will and needs to change if we are going to reach every generation that is seeking salvation. And so that's the sower. The next is the seed. The seed is what the farmer sows, and the seed represents the word of God. And to the farmer, you know, the life of the garden is stored up in this seed. In this seed is the raw materials that can lead to transformation. I mean, a seed can turn into a plant, it can turn into a bush, or even a tree, you know, with life-giving fruit. And so it is with the word of God. You know, there's this urban legend that um, shares that they found these seeds in an ancient tomb in Egypt thousands of years ago, and they decided that they wanted to plant these seeds just to see what would happen. And to their astonishment, those seeds grew. 
Well, I don't know whether or not that legend is true, but one thing that we do know that is true is that the word of God is the seed that is incorruptible. It is life-giving and it's eternal. In fact, Peter says it this way. He describes the Bible, the word of God. He says in, in first Peter chapter one, verse 23, he says, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. So there is life in the seed of God's word. And when we read God's word, you know, we take it into our own hearts or when we communicate God's word to another person, we're we're sowing seeds of potential miracle power. And the reason why we say potential miracle power, because just as in the natural, when you plant a seed into the ground, you know, it's only the good soil that brings forth the harvest. And so it is in the spirit, whether it's salvation or whether it's um, healing or, or fruitfulness, you know, that seed needs to be planted in good soil. Just as we're about to discover, not all soil is good soil. In fact, Jesus is going to unpack this parable and he tells us there are four heart condition soils. And each one of us will identify with one of these four. A good soil is one we'll talk about, but it's not the only heart kind of soil. And so we're going to continue on and we find out in Mark chapter four, verse 15, the first type of soil that Jesus introduces us to. He said, some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. And as soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. You see, in Palestine, the fields were in strips, and in between these strips were hard paths, and these paths were called right-of-ways. This would be a path that the apostles would have walked on as they walked through the cornfield, right? And so the farmer would come, and he'd have to be really generous with scattering his seed, because a lot of it would fall on these hard paths, and because the paths were so hard, it failed, you know, to... um bring forth a harvest. It failed to take root. And so this is the first heart soul condition that Jesus introduces us to. This is the the heart of a hard hearted person. This person heard the word of God, but refuses to believe it, refuses to internalize it. And because they refuse to internalize it, the enemy then comes instantly right away and snatches the seed of the word away from them. You see, remember the problem isn't with the seed. The problem is with the heart soil, right? Because we have never lived in such a time where it's so easy to cast our seed and the internet has made it easy for us. The way that we communicate, the way that we, you know, are able to preach to people. I mean, you don't even need to leave your home. You don't even need to know the audience that you are preaching to, you know, the way that videos and information can be shared. And so, you know, the internet has literally turned every believer into an evangelist. So there's not a problem with the seed. There's not a problem with the form of communication and how we share the gospel. The problem is with this heart soil. Well, can this person change? Can this heart soil change? Absolutely. You know, we find in the chapter 16 in, in, in the book of Acts that there are two things that we can do to influence a person who is an unbeliever who has a hard heart. And this verse reads like this. It says, and one of them was Lydia, a businesswoman from the city of Thyatira, who was a dealer of exquisite purple cloth and a Jewish convert. While Paul shared the good news with her, God opened her heart to receive Paul's message. So the two things that we can do then to influence uh, a person's heart is, number one, we can pray. We can pray and ask the Lord to change their heart. Ask the Lord, you know, to make their heart receptive, to soften that person's heart, just like he did for it, Lydia. And the second thing that we can do is to continue to share the gospel with people. You know, Romans says that how can people come unless they hear, and how can they hear unless we send, you know, somebody to preach the gospel to them? So these are the two things that we can continue to do. In fact, these are the two things that probably brought us to the Lord. I'm quite sure of it. You know, somebody prayed for us. We had a change of heart and no doubt that we had to hear the gospel more than once, right? And so these are the two things that we too can do to influence another person's heart because there is power in prayer and prayer can literally, you know, change a person as we see with Lydia. And and then the word of God can transform that same heart. I'll never forget how this process played out with um, Doug's brother-in-law, his name is Keith and he's married to Gloria. 
his sister. And Gloria, you know, she was a believer. She was practically raised in the church since the time that she was little. But when she married Keith, he was not a believer. And so although she has witnessed to him, she has shared the gospel, she has tried, you know, to live out her, her faith in front of him. For some reason, he was unchanged by what he saw and he was resistant to hearing the gospel. You know, a couple years ago, he got quite sick. And after going to the hospital, he found out that he actually had cancer. And, and because he was quite sick, they actually started him on chemotherapy right away. He did chemo for several weeks. But you know, the thing about it is, is because he had other underlying issues, he got really, really sick. And so together in consultation with his doctor, they decided that he was going to stop the chemo for a while just to give his body, you know, time to catch up and to heal. And in the meantime, after he had stepped away, you know, from um, having this chemotherapy, COVID happened. And, and you know how crazy it got? It got crazy with our hospitals, with our medical system. It was crazy even just to get to see a doctor. Well, his doctor was supposed to be following up with him, but he didn't get the call. A year passed by and he was getting so sick that finally his wife took him to the hospital because she said that he was completely yellow and she didn't think that he was going to make it. Well, sure enough, they ran the test and the doctor came back and told him that the cancer had completely taken over and metastasized and there really was no treatment for him anymore. And so they told him to go home and to put his affairs in order. Well, that was such a shock to hear that. I mean, remember, he had the okay from his doctor to step away from the chemo, but now he was hearing like, well, so sorry, it's too late. Well, you know, Gloria said that she'll never forget the first words out of Keith's mouth when he heard that. He said, I thought I had more time. Well, you would think, you know, someone who has just been given a diagnosis would have heaven on their mind, right? You would think that somebody, you know, who, who knew that they don't have much time to live would be interested in knowing about God, would be interested about heaven and how to get to heaven, right? Not so with Keith. I mean, Doug said that he went to visit Keith. It was just only days after that diagnosis to see how he was doing. And his heart was just as hard and just as close to the gospel as it was before. And so, you know, the thing about it is, is that this really hit Doug. It may have not impacted Keith getting a diagnosis like that, but it definitely rocked Doug's world. Just at the thought of Keith slipping into eternity, you know, without knowing Jesus forever. I mean, that was just, um, just unbearable. And so Doug said, okay, you know, what we're going to do is I am going to spend time with Keith and I'm going to minister to him. But before I minister to his body, his spirit rather, I'm going to minister to his body. You see, Keith was a chef in his younger years and he loved food and he loved cooking and he loved eating. And so Doug and I started praying every day. We got intentional about our praying. We prayed for his salvation before, but now we prayed every day intentionally because we didn't know how long he had. Right. And this was like a priority in his life. Now his salvation. And along with that, Doug would check in with Keith and on his good days, he would pick him up and he would take him out, you know, usually to a burger joint and they would sit in the car and they would eat and they would talk about life and they would talk about, you know, their families and, and just different stuff. I don't know, whatever guys talk about, right? And Doug said that he would always kind of dance around the issue, you know, to see if he, his heart had changed, if he was willing to hear the gospel. And when he could tell that he wasn't, his heart was closed, he would say, well, Keith, would you mind at least if I prayed for us? Keith didn't mind that. He loved it when Doug prayed for them. He said he just felt so much peace, but that was as far as he would go then was allow Doug to pray for him. So this went on, you know, several times. I think Doug must've picked him up four to six times and they just hung out together. And so one day before Doug left, he said, okay, Karen, this is the day. Pray, pray for Keith and pray for me because I am going to share the gospel with him and he is going to accept the Lord. And so after Doug left, yes, I prayed and we got other people praying that this would be the day that Keith's heart would be ready to hear the seed of the word, the gospel. And so they went out and they had some food together. And then Doug just started sharing his life. And he started talking about God just kind of naturally and sharing how he came to God and the things of God. And then, um, you know, Doug said, well, what's your story? Because we all have one, right? And Keith started to share his story. And he says, yeah, I've heard about God. He said, in fact, he had actually gone to church a couple of times when he was young. But somebody said something to him that, you know, just impacted his life. Somebody said something about another believer and said, oh, you can't trust Christians. All, all they ever want is your money. Well, those words were like they just shut the door on his heart to the gospel. And from that moment on, you know, he was unwilling to hear the gospel because he didn't want to be like those 
Christians and he didn't want to be taken advantage of those Christians. And so he became resistant to the gospel from that time on. Well, Doug was so thankful to finally hear his story because now he could tell the truth about the gospel story. And he did, you know, he said, Keith, you, you've been, they've misrepresented God. That's not who God is at all. He said, some, some believers don't live up to, you know, the testimony and how they should be as a believer. But he said, you know, God is loving and Jesus loved us so much. Let me tell you what he did for you. And so he just shared with him, you know, what God was really like and who Jesus is really like. And then, and then finally, when their time was coming to an end, he said, so Keith, let me ask you, do you want to see your wife on the other side? Do you want to live in heaven with God and Jesus for eternity? He says, yes, of course I do. He said, okay, Keith, do you want to know Jesus? Do you want to accept him as your Lord and Savior in your heart right now? And he says, yes, I want to accept this Jesus that you have just talked about. I want that Jesus, not the Jesus I heard about so long ago. And so Doug led him into the sinner's prayer and he accepted Jesus that night. Well, we were so excited. And, you know, uh, my sister-in-law asked me to conduct the celebration of life, his funeral. And you could tell the difference between the believers and the ones that were not believers. The ones that were not believers grieved differently. It's not like we didn't grieve. We were sad that he was leaving this earth, but we were celebrating his conversion. We were celebrating that Keith was in heaven and that one day as believers, we too would be joined with him in the afterlife. And so we're so thankful that although Keith started out and for all of his life had this hard heart, that prayer changed his heart and the hearing of the gospel brought him to Jesus. Amen. So that's the first type of heart soil. The second type of heart soil can be found in Mark chapter four, uh, verse 16. And Jesus describes this person like this. He says, others like seeds sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. So this is a shallow person. This person has no roots. But notice it says this person, this type of rocky soil person, has heard the word of God, has received the word of God, because they have no roots, they wither or they fall away. In fact, you know, the word receive is present tense and has the idea of keep on receiving. And the word joy is from chera, the same root word as where we get grace from. So they receive this the word of God, the same way that other believers receive it in grace. But because they haven't put roots down, they fall away. What I mean by that is they have chosen not to believe the word of God. You see, this is how we put roots down. For instance, let me give you an example. You know how it says in First Thessalonians that we're to worry about nothing, but to pray about everything, right? Well, the way that we put roots down is to obey that word. So for instance, say, you know, trouble hits your life or there's some challenges or adversity or that kind of thing. Instead of obeying the word of God and casting your care and leaving your troubles with God and resting in him, knowing that he's got this, you know, you choose to, um, you refuse to believe the word and instead you get into worry and you get into fear and you get into doubt. You're doubting God's word. You're not believing his word. And so you're worrying. And the Bible says, don't worry. But you know, we feel like, oh yeah, but God doesn't know my situation. I mean, this is for everyone else. He surely he knows that I'm dealing with a lot. And so we give ourselves a pass. And when we do that, we fail to put these roots down. That's what it means, you know, to be a shallow Christian, having no root there. There's this refusal, this doubt that God is who he says he is and is going to do who he said what he says he's going to do, right? I was listening to a podcast several months ago, um, and um, Rick Warren, I believe he was the pastor that was being interviewed. And, you know, the interviewer asked him, he said, you know, how is your congregation faring throughout this time? Can you talk to us a little bit about that? And it was really interesting what Rick Warren had to say, because he was saying that, you know, I don't believe that COVID has caused these problems for Um, believers. He says, I believe that COVID has actually revealed what people really think about God and what they really think about God is coming through their actions. So some are being given over to fear and some are actually walking in faith. And when he said that there was just this witness in my heart, I've talked to a lot of people over the last year and a half, you know, and how they're doing. I have found that to be true. People who seem to have these deep roots, you know, this root system seem to be the ones that are taking this in stride, seem to be the ones 
where they are going even deeper in their relationship with God and they're clinging to the word and they have this faith in God that God is going to turn things around because they trust in him. They're focused on him and they're not focused on the circumstances, you know, and these believers did not get these deep roots during this COVID season. These deep rooted believers got them in a different season of their life. They got them at some other time when they had seen trouble at adversity. And it was then when they chose to believe God. And as they allowed the winds of adversity to blow over them at, at in the past at a different season, their roots went deep and they developed this root system. And so now at going through COVID, they, the, you know, it's the word that has sustained them. It's the word that has held them up. It's, it's the word of God that has caused their roots to go even deeper. Unlike, you know, our shallow believers, unlike those who refuse to believe the word of God, they don't trust God. They don't pray as the word says to pray. Instead of praying, they worry because they can't trust God. They don't know God's faithfulness because they haven't seen him, you know, um, help them in those, um, small times, or they haven't recognized that it was God that helped them through trouble and past situations. And so they have no root in them. And so instead of walking in faith, they walk in fear and unbelief and even in hopelessness. Well, can this person change? Absolutely. This heart soil can change just like the hard hearted heart soil. And this heart soil can change in the spirit realm, the same way that we deal with the rocky soil and the natural. What do we do when we get these big clumps of rocky soil pieces of, of um, soil, right? What do we do with this hard soil? Well, a couple things. We either break it up, we either plow it up, or we remove it or we add water and we soften it so that's able to receive, you know, the seed, right? And so it is in the spiritual realm. Hosea tells us that. He says this in Hosea 10. He says, sow righteousness for yourselves and reap the fruit of unfailing love and break up your unplowed ground for it's time to seek the Lord until he comes and showers his righteousness on you. So we are the ones that are to break up the hard heart places of our, our hearts. We are responsible for our own heart soil and, and we can change the condition of our heart soil by pressing into God, by removing the unbelief, by repenting of that unbelief and asking the Lord to remove obstacles of unbelief. And when we do that, when we repent of our own belief, then scripture says that God comes and he showers his righteousness down on us, right? That righteousness becomes like water that washes over us and it softens, you know, our heart condition that is ready for the word. And after we do that, we find our hearts are softened towards God and towards his word. Then we begin to read his word and stay in his word. And then the next time trouble comes and the next time the winds of adversity blow this time, instead of giving over to fear, we choose to trust God. And we say, God, I, I'm going to stand on your word. I'm going to cling to your word. And that's how we develop these deep roots. And so the third type of heart soil is the thorny type. And this is how Jesus describes it in verse 18. He says, and others are the ones on whom seed was sown among the thorns. These are the ones who have heard the word, but the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. So then at the heart of the thorny soil, is enthusiastic about the word of God. They even like coming to church. They might even be in a small group, you know, or even getting together with their friends and talking about the things of God. But when you ask them about their spiritual life, when you ask them about what they're learning and what is God showing them and what is God doing in their life, they don't have an answer for you. They can't tell you because the cares of the world and the affections for the things that the world cares about ends up becoming like weeds and choking out the word of God inside of them, making the word God unaffected effective. These are people who are swallowed up by the cares of the world, right? They run after the things like things, what to put on our body or, or what to eat. They're consumed with these things, you know, or how to keep up with the Joneses, or they may be thing. They may be people who are, um, running after money, you know, can't seem to get enough of it or, or fame or, or even entertainment, you know, that kind of thing. And it's not like any of these things are wrong in and of themselves. We certainly need food and clothes and, and, and a job, right? And we need relaxation and a vacation every once in a while. But you know, it's when we put these things 
first before God that we run into trouble. When we chase after these things, they become like the weed that choke out the word of God in our lives. Paul uh, explains it like this when he's talking to the Corinthians. He says, everything is lawful, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is lawful, but not everything builds up. And so although we are believers and we do have this freedom in Christ that the Jews didn't have as they were trying to live up to the letter of the law, Paul is saying here that although there is grace and you do have a freedom, doesn't mean that everything that you're engaged in, everything that you're seeking after has any eternal value or is even good for you, you know? I mean, what the world has to offer has is very temporal and it's not lasting and there's no eternal value attached to it. In fact, Luke addresses this in in Luke chapter 6. And he talks about those of you who are chasing after the worldly things and you're putting those things above God. You are getting everything that you are seeking for. You are getting the comfort that the things that you are seeking for is giving you right now. But that's it. There's nothing else that is coming to you. You're getting the comfort that you're looking for. But you know, as we um, seek after those things, what he is saying here is that this is going to end up stunting our growth. It's going to keep us immature. It's going to actually keep us from being fruitful in the way that God has called us to be fruitful. Have you ever seen trees that are stunted? You know, our neighbor, they have a lot of evergreens on their property there, but these evergreens have only grown a couple feet. And these, these have been planted for years and years and years, and they have a potential of growing 20, 60 feet, you know, d- depending on the, uh, the nature of that tree, but they've only grown a couple feet. Why is that? Because if you were to go, go up closer, you would see a lot of weeds. They fail to take care of the weeds at the base of the tree. And so the weeds are crowding out the tree and it's stenting its growth. And so that's how it is for us. You know, if we don't put God first and we continue to be consumed with the things that the world has to offer and the cares of this world, it's like those weeds that end up choking out the life of the seed of the word um, that we read. I mean, we can read the word, but it doesn't have any effect on us when uh, the things of the world end up crowding, you know, the word out in our lives. And so the answer to that is found in Mark's uh, Matthew 6, 33. And it says this, it says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. So again, the scripture is telling us that these things in and of themselves are not wrong. It's not wrong wrong to want nice clothes and good food and a good paying job and a vacation every once in a while, right? But we're not to seek after them. We're not to chase after them. We're to put God first. And he promises that if we put God first, then God will make sure that all these things will be added unto our lives. Amen? So that's the thorny soil. And now we come to the fourth type of heart soil, which is the good soil. And Jesus describes the good heart soil person like this. He says, and those are the ones on whom seed was sown on the good soil. And they hear the word and they accept it and they bear fruit 30, 60, and a hundredfold. So finally the good soil, right? (laughs) And you know, what's remarkable here is scholars believe that Back then, a farmer could hope for at least 10% of a harvest for the seed that they planted. Where Jesus here says, you know, a good heart soil person can expect 30, 60, even 100% of a harvest. That is phenomenal growth, you know what I'm saying? And what sets the other heart soils apart from this number four, this good heart soil, what makes a good heart soil is the fact it is the amount of room that they give to the word of God. You see, if you were to go back and and look in the Greek, that word heard with the first three heart soils, it gives the idea that they heard it once. So they heard the word, but they stopped hearing. They may continue to go to church. They may continue to read the Bible, but in their heart is closed. They've stopped hearing the word. They've stopped taking, taking it in, stopped believing it. Unlike this heart soil person, the good soil you know, allows the word of God to be planted. And then they read the word of God. They internalize the word of God. They give all this room to the word of God in their heart. And that's why they are there um, to expect this kind of a harvest. And what does Jesus mean by harvest? Well, he's talking about fruitfulness. And what is fruit? Well, fruit is a byproduct of the spirit living in our life. You know, it's not like, um, you know, something that's attached to the outside, right? Like you would uh, on the branch. No, it's organic and it comes from our relationship with the Holy Spirit. Or sometimes we call it abiding in Christ. 
Jesus says this in John 15, 4, when talking about this abiding, he says, abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. So neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches, and he who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. From apart from me, you can do nothing. So we see here that it's only as we abide in Christ are we able to produce fruit. Jesus says that if you are detached from me, if you choose not to read the word of God and you don't give that the word of God the room in your life, you can expect to do nothing. You won't be able to bear fruit. You won't be able to do the works of Jesus. We can't even pray because it's as we are connected and led by the Holy Spirit, he leads us into that place of prayer. So it's only as we abide in Jesus that uh, as we stay connected to the vine that we can do all things through the strength that he gives us. Amen. So then in closing, you know, we see that the human heart is like the soil that is receptive to the seed of God's word. And the four type of heart soils are the hard heart, the shallow heart, the crowded heart, and the fruitful heart, right? And just as seed is in the flora, so it is in the fruit. And when a Christian develops their heart and and gets healthy in their heart, they develop this type of fruit. This type of fruit is from the Holy Spirit, and it's love, joy, and peace, and forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And the more fruit a healthy heart produces, the more that we're able to impact the people around us. Because when people come and they start to eat of the fruit of our lives, it makes them more receptive to the seed of the gospel, which brings us full circle, the seed that the farmer, you know, sows in his field. Amen. So these are the four types of heart soil, and each one of us will identify with one or the other. And you know, I don't know the condition of your heart, but I do know that we are living in dangerous times right now. And if we ever needed to put our roots down, it's now. If we ever needed to trust God, it's now. I mean, I've been listening to the prophets, probably so have you. And I'm not a conspiracy theory theorists at all, but I do read the word of God and it seems like things are lining up. And what I'm hearing is what we've been going through as believers, as the church, you know, this is just a dress rehearsal. There is other stuff that is coming and it's not, you know, to make you afraid, but it's to say that, you know, to blow the trumpet that we need to get ready. We need to put these deep roots into the word. We need to allow the word to take root within ourselves and to believe that God is who he says he is. Because the thing about it is, is if you haven't learned to trust God for the little things in your life, you're not going to believe, be able to trust God for the big things. And so today we can change the heart condition of our hearts by praying and asking the Holy Spirit to be number one and repenting of the things that have kept him from being number one. Amen. So I want to pray for us right now in closing. I want to ask you to just place your hand over your heart as we pray for our hearts, because Jesus is a heart um, person and he lives in our hearts and he desires us to have this good soil so that his word can take root and residency in our hearts and grow. So let's pray. So Father, I just want to thank you for your word. I thank you that your word does not return void. I thank you that your word produces which you sent it to, Lord. We thank you, Father, for the presence of your Holy Spirit that is forever transforming us and leading us to Jesus and trying to change us. And so, Father, I just want to pray for that person who is listening today, that person that does not know you. We just ask for a heart change. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you would soften their heart, that you would open their heart up to receive your word, to hear your word, to accept your word, lead them to yourself, Jesus. And Lord, I want to pray for that one person whose heart has been crowded out by the worries of this world or been consumed by the affections of the world. Father, we just pray right now that you would bring a conviction about the things that they're involved in, Lord, that you would just give them a hunger for your word. Give them a hunger to pray, Father. Give them a desire to be with other believers, Lord. Make them strong, Father, and show yourself faithful on their behalf. And Lord, Lord, we pray for that one um, that is like the thorny one, the rocky one where the weeds are crowding out, uh, Father, your word. We just pray, Father, that you would just begin to untangle, you know, those weeds. We pray for the one, Father, that is shallow, that is fearful, the one, Lord, that um, has chosen not to believe you. They have no habit of believing you. We just pray, Father, that that person, Father, would have a change of heart even now, that they would sense your presence, that they would
would feel your conviction when it comes to belief, Lord, and that you would give them a gift of faith, that you would help them to be strong in you, that they would gather themselves with other believers who are strong in you, Father, and that they would know, God, that that you promised that you would never leave us or forsake us and that you are going to be faithful to the end. We thank you, Jesus, for who you are. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your guidance. We thank you, Jesus, um, for how you have brought us through this season. And we know, Father, with full confidence that you're going to bring us through anything else, Lord, that the world wants to throw our way. And we just um, want to give you the glory and the honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I want to thank you for joining us today. And, you know, next week we were supposed to get into the multiplex. Um, they've been having some challenges as they are um, doing some construction on their parking lot. And so it's creating some challenges as far as getting into some of those rooms. Now everybody has to access, access the rooms from, you know, the back entrances. And because of that, we've actually been bumped from meeting there on the 12th. Elections Canada has booked that room and they have given them to that. And so they we've um, pushed up our meeting and we'll be launching our fall uh, time on the 19th and so I don't have all those details for you right now we are still working out some of those details with the multiplex we do have a fall launch of the 19th though and I will get another video together as soon as I have some of those details to to give you and we will get that through MailChimp the newsletter that we sent out and also we'll put up uh, a link on Facebook and Instagram that you'll be able to see that video and and so um, look forward to connecting with you one way or another on the 12th is going to be online. It's going to be some kind of live feed. So I'll get that information to you. And until then, God bless and have a great week.